start. This is day two of approximately an eight series lectures of uh, the energy balance principles. And I want to review today a little bit of where we got yesterday, just very quickly. And that's why I did not erase the board, because we can put it up here. But the, the key take home message from yesterday is we're measuring radiation and then through this latent heat of evaporation we can calculate how much water would have to evaporate to balance this and we go to a volume of water and then multiplied by area depth of water which the depth of water is typically the irrigation that we tell people to put on how many millimeters a day or how many inches a day should you be putting on to balance this equation. So the key point we got to is if we measure 30 megajoules a day, which yesterday we got 30 megajoules, today we're going to get 30 megajoules, it's a clear day, it's summer, if all of that was absorbed we would have to evaporate 12 liters of water per meter squared every day. 12 liters of water. And I always think about a meter squared. This tabletop is probably not, it's close to a meter squared, but that is a lot of water. And it's worth remembering because of these volume and depth things, 12 liters of water is 1.2 centimeters of water per day. Then the meter squared, the depth cancels. So it's possible to get conditions where you have to evaporate 1.2 centimeters of water a day to balance this, but this is an extraordinary amount of water. We, as we pointed out the other day, we get more like half of this. So now we have a case where something's wrong, the typical measured evaporation is only half of what we calculated. So either the model is wrong or the measurements are wrong. And like all science, when we start out with this, we don't know which one's wrong. So we go back and look at the measurements, we go back and look at the model, and in this case, the model is not sufficiently detailed to calculate absorbed radiation. I did a, purposely did a very simple model yesterday and assumed if 30 comes in, every speck of that is absorbed and evaporates water. And that never happens. Not, we never get 100% absorption. So I want to start by dividing this up. Now, before I talk about that, yesterday, we talked about Einstein's P and how much energy you get from this thing. I don't think I made copies of this, but I will and you can have them. Here's the math of this, the key for this thing. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. Um, and the answer, depending on exactly how big you assume that P is, is 6,000 years. So in perfect SI units, it's more like six kilo years, using the right prefix. It's a good chance you're going to die from something else before you run out of energy in that P. And it's, it's a pretty simple calculation. And here's the dimensional analysis of it, showing energy kilograms per meter second squared times a meter is a joule. And a joule is a newton per meter. So when you work through this, you get a good sense of these, um, the units for energy. And I'll give you a copy of this. This is a good time to point out one of the reasons for using SI units. When students do this calculation in class, they frequently get it wrong by a factor of a thousand. Where's the, where's the error? Where's the error? It's wrong by a factor of a thousand. It's hard to tell because you might 
you might, uh, it's such a long time anyway. The place that people make the error, and now I need to create a little bit of room here. It's, I'm going to blame this on the nutrition and food science people because they got, it, they, they got it all screwed up. What do they use for energy? How many calories should you eat per day? That's, you should eat so many calories per day. They capitalize the word calories and they say when it's capitalized it means a thousand calories. That's, nobody else does that. You don't capitalize words and multiply them by a thousand, except they do. And so a calorie, spelled with a capital C, is equal to a thousand calories spelled with a lowercase c. And that trips people up all the time in this. So we need 2,400 kilocalories a day, um, and we should, we should get rid of this capitalized C, but this is a big problem. It's on cereal boxes and it's everywhere, and you just got to know that when you capitalize that word, it's a thousand times, worth a thousand times more. Um, interestingly enough, when you do this math, our energy requirements 4.18 kilojoules per kilocalorie. That's a look that conversion up. We need about 10 megajoules a day for energy for a typical person. I just that's an easy number to remember. 10 megajoules, and now you could start to think about everything in megajoules, and stuff starts to line up. So I'll give you a copy of this. It's just a it's just a helpful introduction to units. And I also want to say one other introductory thing. I didn't mention this yesterday, but at the university we have a requirement for competency in writing for graduate students. And American students don't have a problem with near native fluency, but foreign students, we ask them to write an essay about something to show that they have good command of English. They take this TOEFL test and other things, but this is an essay which I'm going to hand out. You could take a copy of it. It's a short essay. It was written by a woman from China, and I was on her committee. I thought this was one of the best written essays that I'd ever seen by a, by a foreign student. And it's about, as you can see, differences in the educational system between the United States and China. And she talks about her experiences in China where memorization is prized. If you can recite things and memorize them, you're just promoted, you're a genius. Minimal effort to apply the knowledge in creative ways. And she said, I was amazed. Here, people gave me a page of notes for exams. I, I didn't have to memorize. I just had to learn how to apply the information. So that we aspire to help people understand how to apply the information rather than memorizing it, because you can look stuff up in a book. And memorization is uh, not a goal of our of our uh, education, except in some cases where, I guess in the third and fourth grade, don't we memorize addition tables? And I don't know if you memorize those or figure them out, but kids, kids have to pass multiplication tables. And, but beyond that, we're always looking at how to apply <laughs> stuff. So this is a, it's a nice essay. It's short, and, and uh, I, was, I was really, touched by it, and it's, it's part of the reason the world comes to the United States to study, because of our approach to education, trying to apply the principles rather than just memorizing the principles. So, now let's get back to this radiation, and now I can start to 
erase the stuff from yesterday. We're going to keep, so speaking of memorization, this is a good number. You can have it on a card in your pocket or something, but this is a good number to remember because you, it's quickly energy and volume of water. We go back and forth between those units. And it's worth mentioning, let's see, I'm going to keep going here. We don't always use liters, but of course, 2.45 kilojoules per milliliter, dividing numerator and denominator by a thousand. So once you get it one memorized, you can quickly switch. And of course, a millimeter is a is a gram of water. It's a cubic centimeter of water. So that's just switching units quickly back and forth. And I've, in my experience, I've found it useful. I'm using this number so much, I can flip the units in my head pretty fast to, to fit the question that's being asked, what volume of water is evaporated. All right. We get calories figured out. We're going to leave our leaf right there. Everyone's committed this to memory. Now, we got, we got our units conversion. Before I get into separating this, I thought of working this out be in, as a quantitative example of what, how do we calculate this 5%. And I drew this and I got an example for you and I give you a handout on this because everything is quantitative and calculated Here's the energy in, here's photosynthesis, abbreviated, zero, zero, and my example goes up to full sunlight, 1,000 watts per meter squared, and we do our curve on here looks something like this. Now we clamp on a leaf with a photosynthesis system. It's a, I call them clamp-on chambers and you can measure, quickly measure the photosynthesis of a leaf. So we get points on this curve. What do we get out here? What's the photosynthesis? And a typical rate is 30 and this has units of micromoles of carbon per meter squared per second of leaf. So down here we have a thousand joules per meter squared per second, same thing. So the meter squared per second perfectly lines up. Now we can calculate efficiency of photosynthesis with appropriate units conversion in this energy in, energy out. So efficiency is output over input. Real simple, we've just got to get these in the same units so we can make this calculation. So if we have Let's go over here. Output, out, in, 1,000 watt, I'm going I'm to skip right to 1,000 joules per meter squared per second. 30 micromoles of what we measure is CO2 disappearing per meter squared per second under a big line. So obviously our meter squares and our seconds are gone and the output is moles of CO2 that have gone into the leaf and the input is joules of energy. We can't do an efficiency yet. We've got to get this in units of energy. So from our equation which I wrote up here, CO2 
I'm going to skip here, becomes CH2O. I'll put, the, put all of it up here. Water plus oxygen. This is elegant because one mole of CO2 becomes one mole of carbohydrate over here. So we're measuring the uptake of CO2, but we know there's a one-to-one -one relationship with moles of carbon that disappear and moles of carbon that are fixed in sugar in the leaf. So now we can take this times the joules of energy in a mole of carbon. I'm, I'm going to just say a mole of CH2O. And with this, the numerator becomes joules, and the denominator becomes joules. And this number, this is a number you can look up in a book, the energy in sucrose, and this is 480 kilojoules per mole of CH2O. I'm going to give you a hand out here to make sure I get the units right. So this is micromoles, so now we're keeping track of this, 30 times 10 to the minus 6th moles times this, and now the moles cancel. 30 times 480, I can write that down here, 30 times 480. Um, now I got to keep track of the prefix. This is 14.4 joules. The, the units come from up here. Divided by a thousand joules that of energy it took to fix that amount of carbohydrate. So photosynthesis in full sunlight of a healthy leaf, everything going for it, one to two percent. So that five percent is even a little high average for most leaves. It would only get to 5% in lower light levels. And most of these calculations were doing high light. That's why we say we can, we can uh, ignore photosynthesis. And here's what I just wrote on the board in a uh, um, worked out example with, with this. And there's the efficiency and down here 1.44. Now, it's a, right away, I made a mistake I tell people never to do. This model has really assumed inputs. We're assuming 30, and then I wrote the answer to three significant digits. And, and, and you know, I should really say one to two or something down here. But um, we, we all do that, and it helps to show that th th this implies you can make quite a precise calculation. And you can, if you have accurate if you knew this was precisely a thousand and you knew that was precisely 30. But the point of this is you can, it's not difficult to calculate the energy going into photosynthesis. Okay, now let's focus on this radiation component here. And since we all got the hand down and it's up here, take this off, take photosynthesis off. There's one other aspect of modeling that's significant here. You could say, and people do, wait a minute, we can measure photosynthesis. I'm, I'll change this now to 2%. And, and maybe this is more like 1% for respiration. And people say, well, wait a minute, we can measure that. We can put it in the model. Every time you add coefficients to the model and add complexity, you have a greater chance of making errors on the primary thing. It's kind of like writing down significant digits. If you get too worried about the third or fourth significant digit in a model, you can make errors on the big picture thing. And 
in my experience, it's a lot better to get the big numbers correct and really analyze them and don't worry about the small stuff until you really need to, until you're really trying to get three or four significant digits in the answer. So this little graph is worth really remembering both the peak of the day and the integrated total. Because we go back and forth between a daily total for transpiration and an instantaneous value. And when our instruments calculate this, we do this in one hour time steps. So we do each number in here, and it's also possible to just integrate the whole day, but our data acquisition systems do one hour time steps. So now I'm going to focus on a thousand watts in of shortwave radiation, um, and we're going to model like one hour near solar noon when we have a thousand watts in. So this thousand watts, I think I can, let's, let's get rid of this and come back to some of this stuff. I think I can model this to keep my same leaf diagram up here. Here's the sun, and we got to have some appropriate color for the sun. And as every school kid knows, this is the appropriate anatomy for the sun. So the sun's coming in, and we have 1,000 watts per meter squared hitting that leaf. And we'll say this is a one meter squared leaf. If you hold the leaf to the sun, you can see light coming through it. So light goes through leaves. So it's not all absorbed. If you hold the leaf like this and look at it, you, it, you can see light bouncing off it. So light's reflected and transmitted. And we only have to evaporate enough water to account for what's absorbed by this leaf. So we know from lots of years of measurements on leaves, they're all very similar, with the exception of really thick leaves, like maybe a cactus. But of that thousand, about 25% bounces off. And about 25% is transmitted. So suddenly, remember our model, and we are off by a factor of two between the actual evaporation of water and the input. Just with this simple analysis, if only half is absorbed by the leaf. Remember we had, on, on one side, we, we had uh, 1.2 centimeters a day. And then over here, we had 0 0.6 centimeters a day. This is the, the measured from pan evaporation. All of a sudden, if only half is absorbed, our, our two sides of our model line up. <laughs> wow, but we're not done. It gets more, but suddenly there's a big difference, and all we've done so far is account for absorbed radiation. So this term, when I just said radiation in, in a generic sense, this has to be R for radiation absorbed by the leaf. And now equals T plus C squared. So now our challenge is to calculate the absorbed radiation by a single leaf or by a community. And this is applied to anything. I mean, uh, your car parked in the sun, we're calculating absorbed radiation to do this. But it's a key first step because you can see from this, the absorbed can be half of uh, what's incident. And our, it's not difficult to measure the incident coming in. These are a little harder. We, we 
model them and we measure them both depending on the situation. So let's take this, I'm going to erase this. Let's take this 25% reflected. When we calculate energy balance for the planet Earth, for anything, we're measuring reflected radiation, and you can look up characteristic reflectances of surfaces, all kinds of surfaces. You can look up a piece of white paper, you can look up a piece of black paper, and so because this is so common in, in calculations, we got a unique name for it, albedo. And, and that's the fraction of reflected radiation. So we've just said for a typical leaf, 25% as a, as a round number. If we did, let's say, what's the albedo of a black piece of paper? Black paper, if I drew a little thing and colored it in all black, It's about, I'm going to get rid of my zero, it's about 10%. Albedo is, a, is a expressed typically as a decimal fraction, not as a percent. So black paper, 0.1, white paper, maybe 0 0.9. So there's some pretty extremes and leaves are in the middle. Some are around 25%. So I have a handout showing typical values for some common uh, surfaces. See if we can get that on there nice and straight. And this is where we get into, let's, for, here's white paper and black paper. And well, this is really black paper. I put 0.05. This paper might be sort of charcoal if it got up to 0.1. And in this paper, well, I had super white paper here and this was a little off-white, so it's 0.8. But you get the idea. Never mind this column just yet, we're going to get to that. Here's a flat leaf, 25. Now, plant community. If a leaf is 25%, okay, fine, but now a plant community, we got leaves at all kinds of angles and the light bounces around. So typically, a plant community is a little bit less than a single leaf. Because of its vertical leaves and bouncing, it absorbs the light slightly better. Aluminum foil, up there pretty close to white paper. They both reflect light pretty well. In fact, I've been in a lot of discussions with growth chamber manufacturers. What's the best color for the inside of a growth chamber? Should it be reflective mylar or should it be white? And there it's pretty academic. They're both about the same. Um, human skin, that's a good comparison. 50% reflectance from our skin, which brings me to an interesting sidebar. This little graph is an example out of um, Campbell and Norman's book, Biophysical Plant Physiology, or bio, Environmental Biophysics. This is a person in Antarctica. And the energy balance of a person in Antarctica, how, how big of a coat do they have to wear? Well, here you get to go out and say, it's a little chilly, I'll go change clothes. Well, Antarctica, you have to know how cold it's going to be. So what color should the coat be? What's the energy balance of the person working outside in 
a super cold condition. And here's his chest in the sun, and he's in the shade, and I won't go through all the details, but there's an application of energy balance. And now let's take that to the limit. I've had the wonderful experience of working with NASA people and listening to lots of seminars. Now we're going to have a person go into outer space on an extravehicular trip, and you don't get to go say, it's a little chilly, I'll come in and put on thicker gloves. They have to know how that person's going to work. And imagine getting every single finger at just the right temperature in this suit, and the physics are different. There's no air, so conduction and convection is zero, and there's no transpiration. They have to do everything by radiation balance. These numbers are both zero, so the radiation in has to equal the radiation out for this spacesuit. And, um, and that's true of if you're on the surface of the moon, there's no air. So this is all radiation balance. And there's, that's just an interesting example of uh, applications of these principles. Um, snow is a big deal. Look, fresh, clean snow, as soon as it gets a little old, it drops off. That has a lot to do with hydrology and calculating how fast the snow is going to melt in the spring and come down. How, how white is the snow? It doesn't take much to, to drop that albedo of the snow. And this drops, 10% more energy is going into the snow. This also brings us to a theoretically perfect black body, which is a black disk, and that has an albedo by definition of 0, 0.00. And if we ran, if it's theoretically perfect, you could put 10 zeros on this, it'd still be, it's zero. Our radiometers are designed to have a black disk that's as close to theoretically perfect as possible. And you look at that little black disk, and it's supposed to look like it's a hollow cavity. Like there's nothing there, you could put your finger in the hole. If we had a theoretically perfect black body here, it would look like some giant tube that was like a black hole. And it'd look like you could put your hand right in it because there's nothing there. So it's rare we ever get anything that good, but we aspire to make this albedo of those black surfaces as close to zero as possible. So we're coming, I'm going to come to this, and I'm going to come to this in a minute. But there's the concept of albedo. And it's easy to look up the internet, the albedos for all kinds of surfaces, because this is such a big deal. Here's a pyranometer measuring sun in, and if we take one like this, we can measure reflected out. And this instrument, with one turned upside down, is called an albedo meter. That's, and you can purchase these and characterize uh, surfaces. So we, for double the money, you can measure it. And if you don't have a lot of money, you model it. And you're, but it's a critical parameter, the fraction of reflected radiation. So. This, be, before I, I don't know, let me, let me move now from, I'm going to erase this albedo, because we, we, we've all got that nailed, and the albedo meter. So now let's break down radiation. Absorbed equals radiation in times albedo. No, let me take one more step here. Radiation short wave, uh, SW, that's, that's uh, in times albedo 
This other marker is uh, slightly better. Times albedo is radiation short wave ABS, absorbed. And I'm going to give you a handout that shows this all worked out. So we got one component of this for um, absorbed radiation. Uh, but in a single leaf, albedo is only this fraction here. So we need to put a number in here that accounts for both absorbed and transmitted. So typically, we have radiation shortwave in or incident radiation times and the number we're going to put in here is 0 0.5 because it accounts for both transmission and incident. Mark. That should be one minus albedo. Yes, thank you. Is well, fraction it's fraction, fraction reflected. Yep, yep, A, B, D, E, O. So now we got 50% absorbed, and if we're going to assume this 1,000 coming in here, if this one's 1,000 times 0 0.5, now we have absorbed radiation and 500 watts per meter squared of short wave. We have not yet done long wave radiation, but this is the powerhouse of the short wave coming in from the sun at solar noon. There's one thing that we typically add to this to make the model a bit more accurate. You can you can ignore this, but almost always there is additional radiation coming into that leaf from reflection. It comes off of clouds and bounces on the leaf, and it comes off the ground and bounces on the leaf. So in this case, if we're assuming a leaf over ground, especially wet ground, moist soil, 10%. So if that albedo is 10%, if it's moist soil, now we have 1,000 coming in, 10%, 100 watts per meter square. So 500 plus radiation short wave reflected so now we have 600 watts per meter squared of radiation coming in on this leaf to deal with that we're trying to either it's either going to heat the leaf up or evaporate water this is the end of the short wave radiation part when, yes, as soon as these leaves cover the ground, this reflection goes to virtually zero. Only, that this, this is, a, I still put this in as a component because if there's clouds next to the sun, you easily can get 10% off the clouds. So that's, you, you can, it can come from cloud too. I, another way I might have drawn this, different arrow, but here's a cloud over here. I could have drawn it like that, and it's still reflection. And that would be the case for a, a full canopy. This goes to zero, which allows me to make a key point here. Lots of people panic when they find their radiation measurements go above 1,000. You just told me 1,000 is clear sun at solar noon, and i have getting 1,300. Your instrument must be wrong. Is it a partly cloudy day? Well, yeah. And are the, the clouds on the size of the sun? Yeah. Okay. We have seen 
30, as high as 30% reflected off of clouds. That's really high, but 10% off of clouds is, happens all the time. So all of a sudden, their measurements spike, and there's nothing wrong with the instrument. It's reflection off of clouds. Uh, after we drill people about a clear sky number, we often fail to tell them that it can be higher than clear sky when the clouds are like a lens and they, and they focus it. Of course, that also has to do with people setting a range of their data logger. You want to make sure your data logger is capable of measuring numbers higher than 1,000. So this is the story with shortwave radiation from the measurement of incident in to absorbed. And in this particular example, we get 1,000 in and 600 absorbed. Now, obviously, this can vary, but it's an example, and it's roughly half to two-thirds of the total coming in. But this is only shortwave radiation, which is the energy coming from the sun. When we look at, let me draw this up here. If we put the blinds down in this room, so no shortwave came in, we would still have fluxes of longwave radiation. And longwave radiation comes from warm objects, not, not as hot as the sun, but warm objects, and it's proportional to the temperature of the objects. So if you have two objects in outer space, no air, no transpiration, and one's hotter than the other, that energy is going to move by long wave radiation from the hot one to the cold. And these are hundreds of watts per meter squared of energy transfer by long wave radiation that we haven't yet accounted for in this. So we need to add that in. See what I have for typically in in the in the uh, book um, in the chapter seven that I'm following from this, you can see graphs in there. And I'll put this graph over here. And let me let me erase this and put the graph right here. We're still at radiation absorbed. Now we're going to do electromagnetic spectrum. And over here is 400 and 700. This whole thing is in nanometers of the wavelength, in nanometers. This is photosynthetic radiation, which we'll come to. And if we make a curve, of the energy from the sun, it looks something like this. And this is short wave. This looks like this above the Earth's atmosphere. There's no absorption bands in this yet for water vapor and, and CO2. Out here, we get a curve that looks something like that less intensity, but a really long area, and this is long wave. So this dividing line right here, we typically take as 3,000 nanometers, or 3 micrometers, the difference between short wave and long wave. Now I've roughly drawn this to scale because it's the area under these curves that drives the, the energy. And the area under this curve is roughly the same, or maybe a little less than the area under this curve. So long wave transfer is a, is a big deal. This, yes, this is only thermal radiation. 
This is happening in a dark room. You would never get photosynthesis. It only, it warms up the leaf, but it absolutely doesn't drive photosynthesis. While I'm on this, let's, let's, let's analyze short wave radiation for a minute. If we take 400 and 700 nanometers right here, this is very close to the wavelengths that our human eyes can see. 400 is purple, um, and 700 is deep red. It's like the burner on a stove. You can tell it's light, but you wouldn't want to read a book by it. It's, it's, these are the wavelengths we can see, and this area under here is about 42% of the total. Depends on sky conditions, but as a rule of thumb, about 42% drives photosynthesis. It's one of the reasons photosynthesis is so inefficient. It's all this thermal radiation from the sun out here that doesn't drive photosynthesis, but it counts as heat, and it warms the leaf up. This part here, this tiny part, of course, is ultraviolet. And this is about 6% of the total. Then I could show this part in red. This is infrared. INF infrared. This, there we go. This, this red marker is better. Infrared out here. And generally, this zone in here we, we call near infrared because it's close to the visible. So that's all this part in here, and it's 42, this is roughly half, or, or like 52% of the total radiation. So these are three key components of short wave, and all this analysis so far just took, lumped them all together for the, for the three. Because the shape of this curve is important, and out here is where we get dips, black line, showing absorption of water vapor and CO2, big dips in this band. This, this is the, the, there's a big difference between the extraterrestrial curve and what we measure on the surface. And of course our instruments measure what's on the surface. And because this, here's a, everybody, many people here might have seen this magnet. Uh, oh, I need one to show on <laughs> my things. Um, we made this magnet some years ago to help show the shape of this curve. And now with the wonders of this technology, I can make this magnet like big. And Here's this curve at the surface of the Earth, and it's shown in two forms. The units over here are the energy flux, joules per meter squared per second, and now they're per nanometer, so it's just each individual wavelength, and that's the red line. Here's the UV, there's a big jump right here at 400. Here's the visible up to 700, which is photosynthetic photon flux, which is what the plants can use separate instruments to measure this. And then the rest of it out here, now you can start to see bigger energy bands. This only goes to a thousand. And to complete the curve, this should go to 3,000. And this, this tapers off. There's less and less energy out here. But, and you can see the tapering. But this doesn't drop right there. It keeps tapering out. So this is a useful magnet because it shows it both ways. We can calculate the photon flux from this, and that's a different shape of a curve. So the photon flux is what drives photosynthesis in between here, and the energy flux is what drives transpiration. I see this on lots of people's filing cabinets um, in their offices in different places, and that was measured here in Logan at our elevation, uh, noon, solar noon on the summer solstice. So it's slightly different 
at, at different times of the year, but it gives a reference on the brightest time of the year. While I'm on this, we're not going to talk about photosynthesis per se in this class, but our instruments measure both of these and we go back and forth between energy and photons with Planck's equation. Energy is hc over the wavelength. Speed of light, Planck's constant, and the wavelength. And the key part of this is energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength of light. Um, I've got a handout with this worked out, and I don't have it with me today, so I'll, I'll come back to this. But it helps us go back and forth between energy and photons, calculating it in uh, both units. And it's, it's helpful to show a worked out example of this, and I'm, I'll show it next time. So there's our solar curve with uh, absorption bands for, for some of the factors in here. Now let's do long wave radiation. And I've just got a few minutes left before the hour's up. Long wave is governed um, I better leave that up here. Hmm. One other key handout I made for us. Zoom out. Here it is. This is short wave and long wave radiation that I drew right here above the Earth's atmosphere and at sea level. And this is 1.5 air mass is the, the depth of air that the sunlight comes through. If the sun was perfectly overhead, that would be one. But it's rarely is it perfectly overhead, it's at some angle. So 1.5 is a typical amount of, of air for the sun to shine through, and that's what 1.5 air mass is. If it's in the winter, this can be really low angles, it can be three. It'd be heavily filtered at really low angles. So here's these absorption bands, and you can see how tiny the radiation gets out here. It's mostly absorbed above 2.5. This is long wave, and there's lots of atmospheric absorption of long wave radiation, a perfect black body curve, and then the absorption at different wavelengths here. So. We would like to know the amount of long wave radiation hitting things. We measure this with a black body pyranometer or some type of pyranometer. Long wave, we can also measure with an instrument called a pergeometer, but we can also calculate it from surface temperature. And to get that surface temperature measurement, There we go. I love showing this picture of this guy. We go to Ludwig Boltzmann. This is from a book I have of the 100 most famous scientists in the world. I think Einstein was number one. I just, Boltzmann made it to number 24 in this list. And I've really enjoyed reading about some of these people because there, lots of them are really eccentric. That Boltzmann was in and out of insane asylums his whole life. And he, and he made it to 62 years old. And he, he only died in 1906. Um, but what a, what a crazy guy. And I'll, I'll show you Max Planck in this book. 
who was up one of the top scientists. Max Planck is, had a perfectly ordered life. I could imagine him with the perfectly clean desk and nothing out of order. He was just the complete opposite of, of Boltzmann. But Boltzmann gave us what's called the, and then he later, like a lot of things, he paired with Stefan, the Stefan Boltzmann law. And this is the widely used, very famous law for long wave radiation. And in principle, it says energy is proportional to, I always put my fish symbol in here, it's proportional to temperature. So if the surface gets hotter, the energy is more. So that's pretty simple. So if we know the surface temperature, we know the energy, we use this in reverse. We measure the energy coming off a surface and we say that's, that's got to be the temperature of the surface. So we use this both directions. Sometimes we measure energy, predict temperature. Sometimes we measure temperature, predict energy. It has nothing to do with air temperature. It's all about surface temperature. And to make this better than this simple principle, we've got energy equals this sigma, Greek letter sigma, which is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And I've used this enough, I can remember this number. It's 5.67 times 10 to the minus eighth watts per meter squared per Kelvin. So, Here's the big significance of this. Wow, 10 to the minus 8th, you know. This has to be, t Kelvin's a big number, but this, this is a really small exponent. And lots of these constants in our equations have some really tiny, some really big exponents. But here's the amazing thing about this. All kinds of our equations have squared, something squared, or the square root of something. This is the only equation I know that has temperature. This is, by the way, temperature in Kelvin to make this units cancel. It's temperature to the fourth power. So it's really a nonlinear relationship with temperature. But because it's Kelvin, it's, we're going from room temperatures 300 Kelvin, so 300 times to the fourth power to maybe 305 to the fourth power, but this is the relationship. Is that available energy? Uh, is this available energy? We didn't, good question, we didn't get into how much of this is absorbed yet which we need to. Um, this is the tonal energy transmitted. Not all of this is absorbed, <laughs> which, is a, which is a key point, but first we'll talk about what's coming off. I've got one handout and then I'm going to stop and we're going to pick this up next time. And here we go. Always good when I can find my handouts. This is so there's enough exponents in this. Here's a worked out example. Stefan Boltzmann law, the equation right there, 273.15 to Kelvin. So we put this to make it easy to do in a surface temperature in Celsius. And then you put it in an Excel spreadsheet and zoop, you run it. And here's the emitted radiation coming off of surfaces. From minus 40, to plus 80. Hot surface of a car might get to plus 80 or something really hot in the sun. Look at the numbers. Now let's, this is just three columns. Radiation emitted, 25 degrees C, 448. So, as a rule of thumb, this leaf is 25 C. So, 
448 watts per meter squared is being given off by long wave radiation. So all of a sudden, we had 600 watts of short wave absorbed. Wow, 448 is, is given off by long wave. All of a sudden, this leaf doesn't have to evaporate that much water because of long wave emission. Now, here's the, here's the thing that we'll pick up next time. Long wave works both ways. The leaf is giving it off to the environment. But down here, we have ground. And let's say the ground is 25C. Now we have to count plus 448 coming in. So if the ground temperature and the leaf are the same, this net long wave radiation cancels out. And it's a small number. That's the simple basics. Next time, we'll talk about a little letter right here, E, which is emissivity. And what does different surfaces emit at different rates? It's, it's sort of like albedo, only this is emission, not reflection. So this is a really key component, and we'll pick it up next time. Next time, we should be able to wrap up all the components of long wave in this, and so we have a total absorbed radiation and how to calculate it and then we can move on to these next components um, yeah you can see the two graphs down here this is slightly nonlinear be because it's t to the fourth um, and this is the slope of the line so if you can estimate it between two points Okay, any questions that I can answer about this? You did a good job stopping me, and especially when I had one minus albedo. You gotta always be vigilant for, for those things. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow.